Hey guys, this is Velde from OG here. Danish Counter-Strike is one hell of a drug, but so is Thorin's YouTube channel. I don't really want to talk about like the financial aspects of it. That's more like a Richard interview if he did it. You know, it's more his wheelhouse. But I did want to ask about this topic because, as you said before, if the team's all about like comfort and the right people, it's kind of wild that the management's going like, right, you're fired. Who you want? We, you know, we don't want to kick. And then here's a new guy who's like, who the fuck's this? He's your new teammate. There you go. There's the new guy, right? Was this an element in this team? Because I know in some teams, especially back then, oftentimes the player's got to pick all the player. you know, who comes in. Like, I'm pretty sure in Fnatic, like, whoever the star player was probably just said, yeah, get this guy or the in-game leader or whatever. Like, it's it's very, it was very, very rare until, I would say until the last couple of years, the organisations tried to be like, you know, football teams and just sign a player and tell him he's just joining in the summer. So... Do you think this element, was this a problem that you had with the NIP management? Like, was it an issue for more than just this initial period? Were, were they actually like that throughout CSGO while you were in NIP? Um, from time to time, yes. We had a lot of issues with the management uh, that affected our game, not only with the fifth players, but I remember there was, before our major, I think it was when we had Alu and uh, Natu as the coach. Kind of eats at 2015, I think, then? Yeah, because before every tournament, we were used to, to having a boot camp, let's say, uh, especially before the majors, like at least one or two weeks boot camp. And uh, before that major in Poland, I think it was, or was it Cologne? Yeah, Cologne. Right. One of those two, yeah. Uh, we kind of said to them, like, it's one week until the major. Have you, where are we going to boot camp? You know, because they usually fix these things for us. And uh, they kind of just like ignored us and uh, stuff like that. So we had to take it into our own hands to find our own boot camp place, like a few days before the before the major. Um, so yeah, th those were rough times as well. Um, but we've also changed management a few times when I was in NFP. So as I said, it's been up and down. Along those lines, though, I wanted to set this up because when the team stopped just re revolving the fifth, gradually they just took the team apart and obviously eventually it was only get right and forest left but they went one by one so freiburg went first because his stats just weren't that good then you were removed and then basically they just kept like a different version they just kept the right and forest for a couple of years and it wasn't that great to be fair right in this particular period does that mean the management removed exist or did the players actually democratically decide to remove you did you were you even up for it like this is a fight okay it's okay to do this what how did that happen how did it exist leave the team so obviously you're the in-game leader um, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, we we went to a tournament in LA for Summit, CS Summit, and I could I could like sense that something was going on uh, with the management and uh, a few of the players. Uh, even before we went to the tournament, uh, I think it came out like a news that uh, Dennis was going to join us and uh, I was going to be replaced. But it says something funny in the in the story that Forrest was going to take the IGL role. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of like, yeah, okay, this maybe this is bullshit. So I, I asked the CEO and uh, I think the players as well. And he was like, uh, no, you don't have to worry, stuff like that. Uh, then we go to the tournament. We kind of shit to bed. We lose against some Danish team, I think, MSL or something. Maybe, Maybe heroic. Uh, yeah, I think could have been smart that. Yeah, um, we bomb out in the groups, I think, and then yeah, I get kicked on the way home from the tournament. Um, I don't know. I think it was mostly management, but uh, I think the new players that we had in NFP also had uh, a few things to say about that. Along those lines, though, because, again, people are going to think of NIP. Listen, some of you were friends. You obviously had some great times. But I do think fans go way too far the idea that, you know, like, you're the five best friends. That's why you really, they really believe that with, like, Astralis, for example. People, they don't know in nearly all these teams. Someone could have been kicked, like, three times. And, you know, there's someone sometimes even trying to replace someone in a winning team. Like, there's a lot of politics behind the scenes and the relationships. One thing I want to ask about along those lines, because that's obviously a wild story. It's going to sound really bad that, you know, the players were like, no, no, what are you? What, I think that story's fake. And then you just get kicked after the 
tournament. Right? Swedes in general, I've noticed, they're pretty sort of conflict averse. They're not like the Poles who literally are like arguing in the fucking game and like tell each other they're going to kill each other. But then if they win, it's fine after, you know. And I've noticed the classic way in the Swedish scene. It sounds to a foreigner, by the way, really sort of scummy. But I get it again if people don't want to like have an awkward conversation. Basically, the joke, especially when you were back at home, was you would just come online one day and you'd be like kicked from the IRC server or something. And then you message the manager and then they're just like, yeah, you're out of the team. That was like the way they actually used to kick people back then. And so it seemed really ruthless because obviously what you kind of want when you get kicked is you just, listen, even if you get kicked, you just want like the players you played with to come to you and go, look, dude, like it's nothing personal, you know, like I still like you as a guy, but you know, we got to make this business move. Sorry, you know, like enjoy it. But that doesn't seem to happen in Swedish Counter-Strike. I know it's, what, did it, did it leave a bit of a bitter taste in your mouth when you left Nip? Um, I think yes and no. I mean, obviously, getting kicked is never fun. Uh, I don't. I don't think the way it happened had um, would have mattered for me really. Uh, I I talked to Forrest and get right about it, and there was like no hard feelings in between us because obviously Freiber was kicked before and Fifth Friend was kicked before that. Uh, we knew at some point this was gonna happen, you know. Um, but yeah, for sure, it's something with Swedish CS. That's uh, that, that's just the way it happens. When someone is going out, uh, I think all the blame goes on the management, and you, you kind of try to sh- you try to shift the blame from the players and from yourself to yes. the, to the management. I think I think that's very common, yeah. Even though you got kicked, and I, and listen, again, the newer players probably just looked at the stats or th- imagined how some other player was going to play when they joined the team. You know, what some young players are like, unfortunately. Right? To be fair, if you get kicked and then people are thinking, right, finally, he's out of nip. You did have basically the most gangster angster of all time, which is you went and you were just the standing in FaZe Clan because all of my stuff obviously had this like period where he had to just step away from the game. FaZe Clan had been at that point, you know, like a month earlier, like the best team in the world or whatever. I'm sure nobody expected anything, right? And you went to this tournament, I am Sid, and the key detail people forget is Astralis had just won Dream at Masters Marseille and bodied everyone in the whole tournament and like they were clearly already by the way going to become like the best team and in this particular tournament if people know this is the real GOAT Astralis lineup the one with Magisk and Dupree and all those guys and in the grand final right everyone knows Astralis not only won a million tournaments they're like the hardest team ever to beat and so in the final right they don't lose best of fives they not only lost the best of five they lost 3-0 listen it was a very close 3-0 I will say the scores were amazing in this you were even winning some clutches like the team obviously played like inspired counter-strike something was was there actually a more was that like validation for you like i don't need to be get right forest or i am good at the games did he did he care about any of that was there any of that involved with winning this tournament um yeah for sure i I was really motivated to to go and play with uh with face i even had other like um offers to join a team on, on permanent basis that were like top 10 teams but I chose FaZe because obviously they had the best, some of the best play- players in the world. And, sure. Uh, I knew Carrigan from before and uh, I, I, I kind of just wanted to join a team, not be IGL and just do my thing. Um, and I think uh, the first tournament that I played with FaZe, it, it was in Marseille and we got bodied by Astralis, as you said, like they just like 16-5 or 16-6 both maps I think we didn't stand a chance um, but outside of the server we had a lot of fun in phase as well and uh, we we got along really good um, everyone was experienced and um, we knew that we could do much better going into the next tournament so and again, in Sydney, we, we started the tournament really bad against, I think it was uh, Renegades or what was their name back then? I think they were Renegades. Yeah. I the, think the we, Australians. Uh, yeah. I don't even think it was Renegades. I think it was the team below them that is Renegades now. Oh, so, Immunity yeah. or someone like that. One of, one of those teams, whoever the yeah. second best team was. Grey, maybe it was like Greyhound. It could have been that yeah, one. Yeah, right? Greyhound, yes. So <coughs> I think we started the tournament against them in the groups and we played really bad and we were like, what the fuck are we doing? And we had like a team talk and uh, after that, it's like the same lines that has followed me in my career. We, we just <laughs> grew as a team and and I don't know what happened. Uh, in the end, we we played Astralis and, um, and uh, yeah, that was uh, a great final and the crowd was just 
amazing in Sydney. What was it like to play? Because obviously, as we said, you've played with some fucking amazing players and 1.6 and CS Go, some of the best to ever play the game. What was it like to play with Nico? Because a lot of people think this is when he'd like come into his prime individually. I mean, I think Nico, I think he's maybe even the best player that I've played with in CSGO. Um, not only like his aim, but he's, he's very, he's very good, like team wise, team player wise. And, uh, his communication is really good as well. Um, and I wouldn't call him like toxic or anything like that. That's that people are saying about him. He just wants to win really bad. And, uh, he was never toxic when I played there. Um, I was just really impressed by by how he how he was playing. Even though obviously you were only in phase five, I think it was like four lands or something, which is like a not a, it's not a short amount of time, but it's not years and years. You know, you don't know the guys super duper well necessarily. One thing I want to ask was this: when you mentioned earlier the idea of basically it's like the sports concept of like, ah, who cares like what the relationships are? You know, you can put like a guy from the French national team in soccer with a winger from Italy with a Brazilian midfielder. It's the idea that you're supposed to just be a pro and you're just supposed to play the game, and who gives a fuck if your friends just win the game? You know, right? I think phase for me is like a class classic example because like, obviously they built brought all these players from different countries paid them at the time mega bucks and they were on really good salary and it was kind of like that vibe of like you're supposed to win everything but actually it's not about like you know friends and there's no like basis to this team right if people don't know this was a team where i got the vibe actually like if, if I'm saying it's exaggerated that Nipper all friends, I got the vibe some of the players in this team, they, they were just like colleagues. They were just workmates. Like, you know, like after the game, okay, cool, high five, right? I'm going over here. Like maybe Nico goes to a club and then fucking all of Meister's, I don't know, watching something on TV in his laptop and then Carrigan's off with his girlfriend. Like, you know, it felt like everyone was just, it's just a bit about professionalism. Was it like this in the team? Was there any sort of like, uh, what was the team spirit like? Like, how did it operate? I mean, for sure, we, there was like, I didn't play there for so long time, but you 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 could kind of feel the sense that the team was like imploding, um, and ev- eventually they were gonna split up because there was some issues in the team for sure between some of the players. Um, as I said, like if you want to succeed in the long term, you need to get along everyone. I think, um, but. Uh, they had some great success. Maybe it wasn't for the longest period of time, but um, I also think that uh, Robin he did a great job <clears throat> in that team, especially when I was there at like controlling the situation and making everyone comfortable. Um, but yeah, there was something in the air, and uh, I think a few months after I left, they kicked Kerrigan as well. So yeah. Right. Just like I said with the whole Pronax topic where it's weird that you start your careers together and then you're battling each other and you're both in game. You know, it's like, it's like the story wouldn't make sense if I told you that in 2009. Another one that's wild is if I told you in 2011 when Carrigan is just an opera in your team and he's not the IGL, you're the IGL. If I told you that like later, years later, he's the in-game leader and you play under him, that would be another one where it'd be like impossible. Right? What was Carrigan like as an in-game leader? Um... I think uh, when I was playing there with Kerrigan, um, it was kind of like straightforward CS. Uh, we didn't try to complicate stuff too much. Um, he basically called the strats, a lot of the strats from, from spawn and, uh, and then uh, everyone just did their role. And uh, Nico was also helping out a lot as a secondary caller and Sometimes he, Nico just took over the game completely um, as a caller. So I think everyone had a lot to say um, yeah, with Carrigan back then. Right, before we talk about the, the Fnatic period, a question I had, because this came out actually in an interview, is that basically, I think it was Carrigan who said it on an interview I did with him, basically when they knew that, there was this kind of like, you know, Nico and a couple of the others don't want Carrigan anymore. And they're going to remove him and it doesn't work. When they were going to remove him, there was that like a little short list of names they wanted, right? Like I think Pronax was on there. There was a few different names. I think Golden even was, a, uh, no, Flusher I think was on there. Your name was one of the names on the list. Like I, I assume because they just played with you or whatever. W- was there actually a world? Did you ever get an actual like behind the scenes offer? Were you ever close to actually joining potentially and being at the, the FaZe Clan in-game leader? Um. 
I think I never got like a like an offer. Let's say a contract. Here you have you sign it if you want. You know, right? But uh, there was definitely an interest. But as I said, the whole team just felt a bit weird um, for the long term success, and uh, they had their own issues. And also, I don't know. I don't think I could have done a better job than what Carrigan did. So I think maybe in the end it was would have just ended up. I would have ended up in the same situation as Carrigan, you know. So going to Fnatic just felt more secure for me uh, as a player. And it felt like I would have more control over there. Funnily enough, that, was, that actually leads perfectly into this follow-up question, which is when Carrigan was telling this story that you wanted the names, he actually told a little anecdote like that about you. And he basically said, because we'd actually like played together in the same team, that he got the vibe that was exactly what you've just said, that your vibe was sort of like, look, it is a great team and it would be good, but like... Isn't, isn't what happened to Carrigan just going to happen to me? Like the teams, you know, it's too many big egos. It's massive superstar. You have to win every tournament if it's FaZe Clan. Like essentially, by the way, are you sort of saying that you kind of like turn them down? Um, I mean, if did you say if I'm sad if I turn No, I, I, was it actually you who kind of like made the deal not happen? Like would they have actually signed you, do you think, if you just said, yes, I'm totally in the join? Were you kind of like, look, I'm nah, it's not the move for me. I'm going to go for that. Did you, were you the kind of decision maker, do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't know. Um, I don't think it was, I don't think they had decided that they wanted to keep me or something like that. Then they never would have uh, traded me to Fnatic, I think. So, Maybe if I worked for it more, um, if I wanted it more, it could have happened. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Like the trouble, obviously, with the period when you went to Fnatic is even though, like you're saying, like it's another Swedish team, it's like, you know, you get to even play with some players you haven't played with that were your rivals, etc. The problem is the pressure was actually enormous from day one outside just because of the storyline with Golden, obviously, where even though people always scoff this history, like they make it sound like they kicked him the day after fucking kind of eats it, like when they won the tournament, you know. It wasn't. They had a couple of tournaments where they dipped after that, you know, and there was a, and I, I got the feeling from them, they thought those were like magic tournaments, you know. It's like, wow, we had some miracle wins, but like, it's not going to last. And this guy, you know, he's too inexperienced. So I was never like totally on the side of like, this is like the worst move ever. But it did look bad to fans that like, wait a minute, didn't you win two enormous tournaments? And he's kicked this guy. And obviously at the time, you haven't been a big in-game leader for a couple of years. And people thought like, why are they bringing this guy in? Did you did you have a sense that there was a lot of pressure if he came into this for that team? Like it had to perform? Yeah, for sure. I, I think the whole situation, how it happened when I joined Fnatic was pretty weird uh, from day one um there was a lot of pressure from from everyone in the scene that uh, that that we should perform but i think that's also justified because we had some really great players um it was it's kind of a weird journey because i think when i joined i was kind of promised to have like a a full lineup directly right. Um, and then I wanted to keep Lecro in the team, to be honest, because I think he's he's really good and he's a really good role player. Uh, but then they just remove him, and then we keep Golden to play uh, in the first or two tournaments or something yes. like that. And then he's swapped out for 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 uh, Draken, I think. And then like a whole situation with Flusha, he kind of gets. Um, I wouldn't say uh, not motivated, but he shit happens to him and he, he decides to take a break. Sure. Uh, and we don't really know what to do. And then in the end, we end up with uh, Brolan and Twist. And Brolan is someone that I also pushed to, to get from day one uh, instead of Golden and Lecro, I would say. Uh, so in the end, we get a really good lineup. Um, I think we start really good in Cologne. We almost beat Astralis. Uh, they make a comeback. We have like 15, 11 or something on Inferno. Uh, they make the comeback, beat us in overtime. We lose in the semifinals. But I, I think that was a really good first showing for us. And we showed some some good results there. But we we couldn't really find consistency with that lineup either. 
Actually, I mean, it was Chicago, but whatever. It's an easy oh, yeah. easy mistake to make. Actually, I wanted to ask, obviously, about that, because that's, again, basically, on the other side of that, if you're Astralis, that's almost like the defining signature of what Astralis is like, because obviously they did that, like, perfect fucking Molotov execute on B when it was, like, map point and something. Like, you know, basically, it kind of showed, like, why they were almost unbeatable. Like, you beat them when you were in phase, and in this scenario, you know, you had him right on the ropes, as it were, to use the boxing terminology. What was it like to play against, like, the prime Astralis when they were absolutely in their peak? Uh, I would, I would uh, say it was the same playing against Navi in 1.6 when they were at their best. Uh, everyone is just hitting insane shots, and sometimes you just get out mollied, and they have great strats. It's a lot of small factors, and you just kind of feel um, like you, you you don't have a chance to win the match. Basically, I remember when we played with Face in Dallas for Pro League finals. Uh, I think Guardian, he went like 0 15 or 1 15 or something, and ended up the match with like those stats. And we didn't have a chance, you know, they just got entry after entry, and we lost 16 1, 16 2. And uh, when they click, it's really hard to, to beat them and to play against. That's obviously been like a classic divide between Sweden and Denmark, which obviously are two countries right next to each other, but very different as every as people from both countries would explain and stress very heavily. But the obvious divide has been Swedish Counter-Strike, both Nip and Fnatic, even the old teams, because like I said, it was a lot about like having skilled players who like each other. And then the vibe is sort of like, you know, we get a bit of freedom. Like classically, you just play a bit of default CS and then, you know, if you're Forest, he gets an entry here or get right wins a clutch here. And, you, you know, some of it's like individuals get to have a lot of say. Like you said, it's very democratic. The Danish style is more, it reminds me more of like how the Germans play. It's like, right, there's a system and this guy's the in-game leader and he really is like StarCraft. Like he's telling literally everyone that you're going to flash down, you're going to do this here. And it's very extreme and rigid in that regard, right? You never really were in a team that was like, a maybe threat was a little bit like that in 1.6 if you want to like draw the comparison or something. Did you ever want to play tactical CS, like really heavy stuff like that? Did you like the Swedish style? What was your vibe in CS? Um, I think it's it's good to have that style. But it didn't work for us in NIP. I think both when Fifth Iron was IGL and when Threat uh, came in. Uh, to have that more structured style, it didn't work with uh, with me, Get Right and Forest. We just didn't like. We didn't fit in that playstyle uh, somehow. Uh, it worked short term for sometimes, but in the long run, I think all three of us we, we just wanted to to play a more loose uh, game style. Um, uh, I think now nowadays, if you wanna. Or it's always been like that. You need to have both mixtures. If you want to be a really good team and a consistent team, you need to play loose and you, you need to play very structured. And I think Astralis, they, they mastered both of those styles. Um, you can see that they're very structured at times, but when things are not going their way, uh, Dupree is a perfect example. He's just, he can just rush through smokes or just rush with a deagle, get some entries, and then, then they're back on track. You know, I think you need to have both for sure. Sure. One thing I want to ask about is the cool thing is you were one of the only players to play in Fnatic and NIP, whereas like the others just never mixed in their career for some weird reason. Right? When you were in Fnatic, you got to play with Crims, who obviously he was in the team that won all the majors and was in the big rivalry, etc. And in this period, actually, he was still a very good player. He was still kind of like one of the better players in the world. What is Crims like as a player? Like, How do you use him? What sort of role should he be in? I think uh, the best thing about Crims is that you don't have to tell him what to do. He knows exactly what he needs to do, and uh, he's very calm. You, you can kind of compare him to to Forrest, except maybe he's he's not using the op and um, stuff like this. But uh, they're very similar in their in how they play. Very calm, and uh, you you rarely rarely need to tell them what to do. They know what to do. Um, I was really impressed with how he per performed as a player. He was by far, I think, our best player as well. Right. In um, the Fnatic period where you had like the odd good result, unfortunately, the way it ended 
was, it's actually almost a flashback to how NIP's problems happened. It was basically where you didn't get through the minor, so you didn't get to play at the major. And obviously, again, just like Nip, Fanatics and organization were actually, no matter what the lineup is, in their mind, they should be at the major. You know, they should at least have an outside chance to do something because it's Fanatic, right? Was this like a moment where, did you actually kind of know when you failed that? Like, listen, if I'm not kicked, like someone's getting kicked, like something, something's going to change. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, I think even before the major in uh, Cologne, I kind of felt like I, I, I want to lead the team because I wasn't comfortable and we were not performing good. Uh, I don't think anyone was happy with how things went there. Um, so for sure, I was expecting that the team would would change uh, something. And um, yeah, it happened to me, be me and Twist. But I also think like from day one, since I joined Fnatic, we were always talking. There was always talk about like changing lineup and changing a player we we never really gave it a chance it felt like um and then it was kind of weird with twist and jw they're both uppers they had the same roles and i think twist got kind of um fucked in that situation where he was forced to be a more supportive player and be an anchor on most sides which didn't really fit him. And um, yeah, I think from day, day one, we were struggling a lot with the, with, uh, the lineup in Fnatic. There's obviously some teams, and obviously it's more of a, like I say, a sports approach of GMing, where if a player's playing bad, you just kick him and get someone who's playing well, and you think it's like plug and play, basically. Like, I always thought the Brazilian teams were a bit like that. Like, as soon as someone did badly and they didn't win the tournament, like that guy's just out, and then whoever the next hot player is comes in and they see if they can immediately start winning again. They want the honeymoon success, you know. It seems like from this interview, your approach is kind of like classic NIP. In general, you want to keep the whole core together, right? Do you actually have that philosophy where it's like, You'd rather work through a problem with a guy, even if it takes more lands, than than do the the move for the hot young guy. I mean, I think you need to to give it a fair chance for sure. But I think a big mistake that we did in NIP was keeping the core for for too long. There has to right. be you have to draw the line somewhere, you know. Um, there's there's a fine line between there somewhere. Um, but for sure, you need to give it a few more. You need to give it three or six months at least with a, with a lineup before you can say that someone needs to be kicked. For 2020, where you made this Dignitas lineup, which just was the original NIP, except for obviously Fifth Lara wasn't playing. He was like working in management at Dignitas. Yeah. Fifth Lara actually told me this story over a beer, like a month or two before it happened. Like he basically told me, like, you're going to think I'm joking right now, but I'm actually building a team in Dignitas that just is the original NIP. And I was like... This is a joke. And why, why though? Why would you do that? They're like, I said, do you not have any money or something? He's like, no, we have money. Like, I just, and here's the thing, right? Certain players in Nipple like this, Fiflara and Freiburg mainly, they really did believe to the very end that like the only move they made was the opposite of what you said. They should never have split up the original five. The original five was like, I don't know, fucking Power Rangers or something. Like they were, they were just the perfect fit and they would have eventually come back to the top and, you know, all those teams that, like you're saying, in practice you were beating, you would have figured them out eventually, right? When you made this particular team in Dignitas, you didn't really think it was going to be like the best team or it was going to win again. Or like that, that was like, a, was that, was that vibe with any of the players? What the vibe was? Cause some people wonder, was it just like a, a fun project? Like, yeah, let's play again one more time. Did you really think you could actually be competitive? What was the vibe for you? <coughs> uh, no, I, I think we, I think we all felt that we could be way more competitive than what we, what we showed. Um, I think we were all a bit disappointed in, in how it turned out. In the end, I think we started pretty good, uh, but we couldn't really uh, replicate what we what we did in the beginning. So I think we were all disappointed. But uh, going in, making a project and uh, starting everything, I think we we every one of us thought that we could actually maybe have a like win a tournament somewhere, you know, even if it's entire tier two CS. 
one thing that obviously like you can't be blamed for and is super whack is because of the situation where we had to go to online play. Technically, this team only played one game on LAN ever, which was like the first game of Flashpoint, and then everything went online. And they, I mean, they, they had been LAN since, but the Digitas lineup had long since changed by then. Yeah. Like, listen, it's a softball question because I'm sure I know where you can regularly going to go with this. But I think of that era and I look when everyone went online. And because at that point in time, aside from qualifying to a tournament, no one really gave a fuck about online play. It's all about like you go to the lands and the majors, obviously. And your team is super experienced. Like I noticed there was a lot of the teams that were really good land teams right before we went online, Mouse Spots and Fnatic are the two obvious ones, where they also just fell off completely. Like they couldn't even come like top eight sometimes. And it can't just be like they didn't all forget how to play Couch Slayer. Like, Woxic didn't just wake up and have no hands anymore. Something about mentality or the way the game plays online was different right that must have also been like a motivation killer that you're just playing a million online qualifiers and again you're not even sometimes playing good teams like it must be hard mentally to just keep like focused on the idea of like we're going to improve right yeah for sure i think covid uh, hitting that same exact same week as we went to our first land had a had a big um uh, was a big factor in how we how we played we were always a much better LAN uh, team even when we were at our peak I would say um, so just going back to online and playing all those like tier 2 and even tier, tier 3 tournaments and qualifiers was just really rough and a uh, huge like uh, motivation just disappeared I think for, for some of us I know some players, I mean, look, I'll say Kenny S because he's a mate of mine, actually. He wouldn't even mind me saying. He's also already someone who, when it was all lands, would occasionally have like, you know, six months where he wasn't that motivated or, you know, maybe the team isn't going to win. So he's like, ah, I'll put in a little bit of effort, but I won't go like hard as fuck screaming and playing a million hours of CSDM. I know he's an example of a player where the reason he's not playing now is, yeah, it just sapped his motivation to play a million online tournaments and be like, when's the next land? What, never. And then, you know, you, you're getting worse and you think, you know what, maybe I'll just take a break. Is there a world in which, like, you could have gotten... a uh, I can offer or two at the end and he could have still been playing today and he could still be in mixing it up or maybe even being like a top 15 team. Has it killed your motivation? Do you, like, I know one thing as well about the online period is some of the teams don't seem to want to spend money. So yeah, that's why they get, you know, the FPL kid and then people like actually Guardian and Kenny S are sort of like just nowhere. They're not, they're just not, they're not playing in the top tier. So how, how did this period end for exist? Like in theory, would you like to still play if we but is there any condition? Would it have to be lands? Would it have to be top thing? What, what's you got? What's your status? Like, did you basically choose to retire totally yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, I had some offers after Dingtas, but not from any top team or anything like that. But I had the opportunity to keep playing and to um, to play in the lower tiers. But I just felt like that's not something I want to do. And I, I felt like my own personal level uh, was just not where I wanted it to be. Uh, I wasn't even like happy playing CS anymore because I felt like I wanted to do so much better than what I was doing. Um, so I, I just kind of went through like a bad spiral, like the whole at the end in Tignitas. And even when I was standing for Gen G, it was just like I wasn't enjoying the game and I, I, I couldn't put that many hours into it because I just wasn't enjoying it. I couldn't like force myself to do that. So after taking the break, uh, after I was playing with Genji, I just felt like I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I want to I wanna try something new, you know. So when I knew that and when I announced that I was going to retire, I just felt really relieved, you know, and um, I'm really excited for the future now, for sure. Right. Fans can obviously be very cruel and very fickle. Like, you know, you're on top of the world one day and then the next day, cut this guy, shit or whatever. But the thing is, they're also fickle in how they pick between players. Like, I'll give you an example. In theory, he's always still been pretty good. But in theory, Forrest could have like three months where he's bad. But if people are Forrest fans, they'll always believe he'll be good. And, they, you know, they would never they would never say to cut him from a team because Forrest. But in your case, I always thought you and Freiburg 
was sort of the players that like the Nip fans, when you didn't win anymore, just started to blame, you know, and just thought like, oh, it's these players, like they're holding Get Right and Forrest back. So as a result, even though you had an incredible career, like I always cite this to people, if people want to see, it wasn't just like the first six months or nine months that you had success in CSGO. Like if people just go on that HL TV page where you can see how many land trophies someone's won, Dude, off the top of my head, I think you're like still top five. Just you individually are like still maybe in like the top five land trophies won in CS score. You won like 23 or something absurd. So do you actually feel as though, do fans, do you think fans know and remember who exists? Is? Do you think they actually rate you like you were a good in-game leader, a good player? Do you get the, the vibe that people get who you were? I think so, yeah. I mean, I've gotten a lot of nice mess- messages from people, uh, also from you, when I retired, like, but when you're playing and when you're playing bad, you don't get those messages. You, you get the bad messages, right? Yes. So I think, yeah, I think you can get kind of tricked into believing that you're someone else, then maybe you're not. And I think that's what a lot of players have gone through towards the end of their careers. Uh, they only read the bad stuff because basically that's the only thing that gets written, you know? Um, but but yeah, I, I'm I'm really happy with what I've achieved, uh, of course, and I I think people I hope people know that as well. <laughs> Obviously, from this interview, like when I asked, you know, how certain players worked, how the team system worked, people will hopefully have gotten a better sense of like what you actually did and how, what you did. Like, for example, obviously, you didn't just stand behind Forrest and go run in there and kill everyone and then go, right, get right, win this clutch. Like, you, you weren't playing like that. How would you, from the outside, if, if you had to describe, exist the in-game leader, like what's your style? What are your strengths? What, what are you good at? Um, I think I was I was really good at... Uh, playing off my players' strengths, I was using. I think I was using my players at uh, at their best strengths, um, and I, I like to to make plays myself, involving my own skill a lot. Um, but um, I was also fortunate to play with some really good players and some really unselfish players, like Freiburg, for example. You tell him to do something and he's he's just gonna do it no questions asked you know i think having players like that is just really important for a team and um after fifth iron got kicked it was it was basically me and Freiburg having all the shitty roles and um yeah at Pierce it was rough but i've always tried to do my best just to make the team win tournaments i don't care if i have four and 16 in stats instead of like 33 like get right or forest had sometimes but um towards the the end in nip and uh, fanatic i was really struggling like individually and um you could you could also see that on the strats that i was calling that it just didn't work so obviously, an interesting detail that you did was when you announced you were retiring and you said, you know, like, I'm not playing anymore and all those nice things, you sort of put a line in at the end that was sort of like, but I'm really excited for what's coming next in CSGO or something, which like, first of all, I mean, one thing that's good is you weren't saying like Valorant next or whatever, because obviously everyone's mad depressed by that storyline. But now people are wondering, like, does that mean Exist is going to become the coach of a team? Like what, like what, can you give us at least like, a hint or some sort of direction that you might be headed in. What, what do you think's next for Exist? Um, right now, I am actually helping uh, a team out, like behind the scenes. Uh, I, I see myself in the future, if I get the opportunity to coach, I want to try that out. Uh, I love, I still love CS, and uh, I still want to be be a part of of the whole community. Uh, but like. When I decided to retire, like, well, well, I told, I asked myself, like, what am I going to miss the most? And it's going to be like the, <clears throat> the locker room feeling, you know, just being on TeamSpeak or, or going to a LAN tournament with a team, you know, just the whole like atmosphere. So if I can be a coach, that's something that I want to try out at least. At the end of this interview, do you have any kind of a final message, something to say? Do you want to thank or say hello to anyone? Um, honestly, it's uh, like, like a huge 
thank you to everyone that has uh, written to me in the last few days or last week when I retired. It's it's really fun and uh, nice for me to see that I that I still have the support and um, also like a huge thanks to all the fans that we had in NIP and uh, in Fnatic, both in CSGO and 1.6. Um, so I, I'm just grateful for all, for all the support, basically. Tak så mycket. Thank you. This video was kindly supported by Chris with a K, Lager15, Matt Pugnacio, Dracula, Skaparan, Travis Goff, Zach Smid, Adam Orks, Alexander Rao, Animosity, Bot Pounder 420, Chris, Eric Hillestad, Hades, J Dobbs, Jensen Gore, John Shelton, Joseph Ginsburg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Zumba, Zyrathenia, and special thanks go out to both Jerky's Minion and DZL. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for some of my content? You want to ask me a question in one of those video AMAs? Do you want teasers? Who's going to be the guests on my next interviews? Do you want to take part in a lengthy esports discussion with me? Well, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Skulluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.